Good morning, everyone. This is uh, time is uh, nine, and I think we should start our proceedings on time. And this session is mainly two presidents' guest lectures, lecturers, and uh, one foreign faculty. However, one of the guest uh, lecturers he could not make it for the reasons which beyond his control as well. Uh, I, the president's guest who, is, who, who could make is my mentor. He's uh, Professor Jean Duan, Jr., because his father is also in same, goes with same name and senior. And brother, his son is Eugene Dizwan III. During my formative years, that is 20 years ago, I spent a gala time with Jean in, 96, in 1996 and 97. And I watched his greatness, his vision, his progress, his spectacular vision towards the world. And most of it I imbibed. And uh, thank you for that, Gene. Whatever I am today is his contribution. Indirectly, he contributed to the upliftment of Indian ophthalmology. I would now invite Zin Dijuan for you. He has two uh, experiences to share. However, back to back, uh, I suggested that we'll have the Andrews talk in between uh, to, uh, two of his talks. Jean. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so special for me to be here, um, uh, Dr. Maji. Uh, it's hard for us to believe that it was 20 years ago that you were at Johns Hopkins uh, working hard and uh, making important contributions together. And it was uh, special. Uh, he's a remarkable man, and I'm sure many of you know. And uh, so it's a big honor for me to be here. I really do appreciate it. This is uh, basically at the time you were there in, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this was in a television uh, commercial the people who from Apple, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. And uh, Dr. Machi has this view. With regard to me, and I, this, the purpose of this talk really is to share kind of over a 30 year period, my professional career, things that I thought about at the time and where they ended up now 30 years later. Uh, so my father and I, uh, taken shortly uh, my first year, uh, I like to say this was uh, taking in honor of my decision to go into ophthalmology. He was an ophthalmologist, and he said I could do anything I wanted after I finished medical school. <laughs> uh, Dr. Machi, uh, you know, like I indicated, I'm very honored uh, to be here as a guest uh, for, doc for the Congress and uh, appreciate the invitation so much. I was, I trained at Johns Hopkins and then for my vitreoretinal retinal training, I went to Duke University where Dr. Robert Mockamer was. And Dr. Robert Mockamer was the uh, founder or the inventor 
of vitreoretinal surgery, closed vitrectomy, basically like we do now. I was there for nine years, and uh, it was a very good time, and I met some very special people that we I will talk about. But after being there for about nine years and doing a lot of development, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to work with engineers in a lab called the Microsurgery Advanced Design Lab, or the MAD Lab, and uh, decided to do this and was invited to go back to Johns Hopkins and uh, establish this lab in clinical practice. And uh, shortly thereafter, that's when uh, Dr. Maji came. So there, some of you might uh, recognize uh, some of these names if you don't know the uh, if, if you don't know the way they look now. This is Dean Elliott, uh, who's now head of vitreoretinal surgery at uh, Harvard and Mass Eye and Ear. Uh, this is Mark Humayun who is the um, very distinguished professor, got the Medal of Honor uh, from uh, Barack Obama uh, for his uh, intellectual contributions. Uh, myself, uh, Phil Ferron, and who has been in leadership positions at, in the American Society of Retinal Specialists. Uh, here are uh, some of my corneal colleagues at Hopkins, uh, Walter Stark, John Gotch, uh, Bob Avery, and this was uh, Julia Howler's three children uh, when I had uh, gotten my, my midlife crisis car. Uh, just to, to kind of look at what happens over the years, when I was at Duke, there was a young third year medical student who said he wanted to come and work with me. Sure, you can come and work. I didn't have an idea of what we would do together, uh, but he, I had a package of old experiments that had never been written up. I said, here, here's this box of experiments and data. Please look at it, write it up, and then you can be a co-author. And that was his first paper. After a year of working together, uh, we uh, talked about the procedures, uh, what things he was interested in, and I had an idea uh, about some retinal tacks, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And he loved this idea of making tacks somehow functional. So uh, here's Mark, here's his wife, and uh, two beautiful children, and this is when we had left Johns Hopkins together to go to, um, to USC. One of my other colleagues uh, that I trained with was uh, Dr. Paul Sternberg, also a vitreoretinal surgeon, also went to Duke with me to train with Dr. Mockamer. Uh, two years ago, he was the president of our American Academy of Ophthalmology and uh, it's, so it's just the people that have crossed my life have made very, very important contributions. Uh, here we are as fellows uh, congratulating one of our mentors, uh, Reese Landers, at Duke University. Uh, there's so many people that have been fellows with me that have now become very proficient and famous in, uh, completely in their own right. Obviously, Dr. Machi, uh, Kirk Paco, uh, Carl O. Uh, if you are vitreoretinal surgeons, you know these names. Uh, Not Lowenstein, she, while she was with me she, at Johns Hopkins, she wrote 20 papers. Bob Avery, many, many others. This is uh, Hans Grieshaber, when Grieshaber Instruments were an independent company. Uh, Kirk Paco when he was very young, as uh, me, <laughs> uh, had different color hair. I've dyed it white. Uh, this is uh, 
Dr. Machi, Anat Lowenstein, Carl O, now, now Kirk go from here to here, and many, there's Mark, there's Carl, and myself. Peter Campichero is another colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins. He's made very important contributions. And it was uh, very interesting to me. This is uh, uh, Robert Mockamer. Uh, this is me. This is Tetsuo Hida, uh, Peter Campichero, my wife Libby, Dyson Higginbotham, who was a, a great uh, machinist. And here we're working hard, you can see, uh, at one of the meetings. And uh, Peter had suggested that I should do drug delivery. I'm now been very active in drug delivery for the last 20 years. So uh, when you start, uh, you don't always know where you're going to end up. This is uh, my beautiful wife when uh, we were uh, married uh, after our, on our honeymoon. Now this is uh, our four children and uh, three son-in-laws and four uh, uh, now six grandkids. So just to talk about the innovative process a little bit and how it's a little bit different than the scientific process. Uh, science, we know, starts with a hypothesis. We hypothesize something and then we design experiments to test these hypotheses. Discovery is a little bit different. We actually start out on a journey. We we go somewhere where we haven't been. We go down a trail that we haven't been. And it's, we don't know what we're going to find. But we discover something that we don't really, we weren't, we were looking, but we didn't actually know what we were going to look for. Innovation is different. Innovation starts with a problem. And it doesn't really require kind of the same type of questioning. and in innovation, if you solve the problem, it doesn't matter how you solve the problem. It doesn't have to be sophisticated or complicated, although it can be. So knowledge, if you like science, and its application, which I like to think of in innovation, is critical to our human development. Innovation is also different than an invention. People like to, they use these words interchangeably, but I like to think of an innovation as something that changes the way we act. So great innovations are things that change the way we do things. And it may be phacoemulsification, closed vitrectomy. These are things that drastically changed the way we did it. Whether it's <laughs> blue or red or long or short uh, is, can be an invention, but it doesn't really change what we do. I like to also to think in medicine that the innovators are very rare. You can, we can almost uh, count the innovators. Uh, there are many scientists, and we don't know necessarily all the scientists, but we tend to know the innovators because they affect what we do every day. I like to think of them more like poets than writers or artists than painters. Why don't we have more innovators in medicine? Well, I like, uh, of course, we're taught, first, do no harm. Make sure that we're doing the right by the patient. And f clearly, physicians should be very skilled, and very experienced, and very logical. There's no reason for us, normally taking care of patients, to be innovative. I like to make the kind of the joke, you don't want to take your car to an innovative car mechanic. You know, he says, you know, I've never done this before, but I think if we put vinegar in your car battery, it would be much better. I say, no, 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 just thank you. Just put regular water in my battery and it'd be okay. Uh, you know, so innovation is, uh, is something that comes with an expense 
and mostly in medicine, we don't want too much innovation, particularly on us. Also, in academia, in universities, they don't really value innovation. They value originality, the first to do something, the discovery, the, 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 the new thing that wasn't known before. Sometimes an innovation can be very simple and not, and not be so dramatically new. It's almost like, why shouldn't it be like that? I think this is changing because of, of its recognition of what has impact and what isn't. If you looked at uh, Robert Mockamer as an innovator, of course, he, uh, we know about his uh, advances that he gets credit for appropriately for vitrectomy. But there were so many things that he did that made it practical. Initially, he made the, the instrument that, to remove the vitreous, to aspirate and remove the vitreous. But then he figured out that he had to have, initially it was done with the slit lamp at the, in the uh, with the slit lamp microscope so that he could see in the back. And then he put a fiber optic inside of the eye and illuminated from inside of the eye. A dramatic uh, advance that he did. Membrane peeling. He was the first person to imagine that you could remove a membrane off the surface of the retina by peeling it, grabbing it with forceps and peeling it away. I don't know what type of person thinks of these things that were very um, taboo to do something, touch the retina. He was practical. He created the first Zeiss microscopes with XY. I mean, all of these things are obvious to us now, and w nobody knows why or who did an XY because they were so obvious, but they didn't exist before. Cannulas, small intraocular scissors. He was the first to use intraocular drugs. He, he was injecting triamcinolone to treat um, PVR in particular. Uh, he did other things like uh, anti-metabolites, uh, uh, 5-fluorouracil, and he was really driving these things. This was as interesting to him as the vitrectomy aspects of it. Clearly, he was involved in many techniques, giant retinal tears, PVR. I love the story of him treating uh, PVR. He, he operated, I think, 29 times in a row for this very untreatable disease of scarring after retinal detachment and failed 29 times in a row. It's not that he acutely failed. He could get the retina attached. He learned that he had to remove tissue or scar. But eventually, he, he didn't give up. I don't know how many of us could sustain 29 failures in a row. So just talking about some uh, thoughts that occurred that had dramatic effects later. So you don't always know, you know, you fall in love with a woman, you don't know what your grandchildren are going to look like, but, you know, or even if you will have grandchildren. But so there are some very interesting stories in it. Just say, so it doesn't matter where you start. You just need to start down that path. So initially, back in 1985, we didn't know, we didn't have a good way of treating giant retinal tears that had folded over. So we didn't have perfluorocarbon. We didn't have other uh, ways of treating that. So we would. The idea was, and the initial idea actually came from Japan, of putting a tack to hold a, the retinal flap up and, and put it into the sclera. We made a, that was a permanent tack. You would put it, you would leave it. We made a different type of tack that we could place 
temporarily and remove if we wanted to. And we reported this for the repair of giant retinal tear. This was the, the first case that uh, this was in that report. It was a patient that had had an industrial accident, an explosion, had torn his retinas, uh, had destroyed one eye completely, and this was his uh, other eye, all folded up, on, rolled up on itself. In 1985, or in 83 when this was, there was no way to repair this detachment. Uh, this was, put these tacks, you can see here, there are five tacks to hold the retina out. In this case, silicon oil could then be placed, and this patient eventually got to 3200. It was really a remarkable event at the time. Well, uh, after that, uh, I'm gonna, after that, perfluorocarbons came out. Retinal tacks were no longer really needed or viewed as important. And uh, this, this kind of drifted away as a therapy. However, in 2002, almost you know, 15 years after that initial report of retinal tacks, Mark Humayun, that medical student that I told you about, uh, continued to work, in this case, <coughs> excuse me, with a company called Second Sight. Uh, it's another interesting story that I'll share. Thank you very much. Payment is this. Hmm? Payment is this. Okay, when do I need to? Seven more minutes. Okay. I'll go a little faster. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, is the electrode of what was called the Argus One, the first intraocular prosthesis. We tried different things to get this in place, but we were never able, like glues, we were not able to uh, keep it in place except with these retinal tacks. It was the first, it was an FDA approved device as a retinal implant, and this is what, uh, what turned out to, and it's still being used today. Iris retractors, uh, iris, flexible iris retractors, everybody knows about flexible iris retractors. Uh, do we develop these? But I developed them to treat ROPIs, uh, infant premature eyes, and they needed to be flexible so that they could uh, work within the orbit of the, of the premature infant. I had a colleague who was a cataract colleague said, I think it'll work for cataract surgery. It's, it's amazing that, you know, I had no clue. I thought maybe this would be used 100 times a year and then it turned out to be used, you know, many tens, hundreds of thousands of times. When we moved to the Mad Lab, and Johns Hopkins, I took people, uh, I took, I combined it with engineers, Scott Rader, Alex Walsh, Pat Jensen, Signa Erickson, Aaron Barnes, had a machinist, Terry Shelley, brought with me uh, my, at that time, my fellow, Mark Humayun, Carl, Carlo, and me, and then we developed commercial relationships with companies to make these things more real. We did many things in the MAD lab. We developed 25 gauge uh, standard vitrectomy called transconjunctival vitrectomy. We developed several drug delivery efforts, flexible instrumentation, curved laser probes, extendable curved laser probes. We explored things like translocation and, and vein cannulization. We developed many concepts at that time. We developed an ocular robot that now is still uh, being developed. Uh, intraoperative diagnostics like OCT and ultrasound, voice activation, and uh, a focus on uh, surgical uh, ergonomics. Mark and then a PhD student of mine, Rob Greenberg, 
uh, continued to work on the prosthesis and a company called Second Sight uh, was established. We did human transplants of RPE and retina at the time, again with uh, Dr. Machi at, at the Prasad involved, and uh, developed drugs for a variety of diseases. Many of you know that 25 gauge, uh, our transcontrin tablet vitrectomy was developed at this time. It took 10 years for this to essentially become the standard in vitro retinal surgery. Many patents over a wide variety of uh, efforts, uh, voice control, this was back over 20 years ago, we were talking about controlling instruments in the OR, lights on, lights off, you know, uh, at the time. All kinds of things regarding the prosthesis, drugs to treat uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy, essentially anti-VEGFs at that time. And uh, on and on. We did a company, it's called uh, Interex, for these drugs to to treat, uh, there were anti-VEGFs to treat uh, before uh, Lucentis was known, to treat diabetes and coronal neovascularization. I uh, started it with my father-in-law, uh, with my brother-in-law and some money from my family. That's not the way to do it, but uh, we had some ideas. That how do you get an how do you get drug into the eye and able to remove it. And this small corkscrew idea was the way we uh, did it. it. It turned out that it worked pretty well. Uh, it was eventually purchased uh, by a company uh, called Sermotics, and they were supposed to take it forward. They never did. It was quite interesting. In that company, we had two other technologies that we had to go back to Sermotics and ask if we could develop them. One was a punctal plug that eluded drug. The, this idea is that you don't need to uh, treat with drops. It can just elute fr uh, from the punctal plug. This was developed and uh, eventually uh, very quickly sold to QLT that did Visudine. And uh, they're still in the process of developing this technology. Uh, another one was a reservoir. This was also in Sermotics that went with, were inventions from Johns Hopkins. This reservoir could be refilled or ex it could also be expandable. So you could put drug inside of this reservoir inside of the eye. This is now going through a phase two trial in the United States with Genentech and it was uh, uh, purchased by Genentech and I think it will dramatically change the way we deliver uh, anti-VEGFs to the back of the eye. The prosthesis, like I told you, started uh, with an idea with Mark Mayan as a medical student. And, you know, we hear the, the first inventors, myself, Mark, and my next door neighbor who was an uh, engineer, Howard Phillips. And uh, this was my, my graduate student, Rob Greenberg, who, and this was the head of biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins, who brought uh, Rob over to see what we were doing. He became CEO of Second Sight, and this company uh, went public and had a fairly high valuation up to uh, almost uh, 500 million. So uh, this is one of my favorite uh, Quotes from Helen Keller, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Security does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than exposure. Thank you. Uh, Gene has uh, a crazy mind, I would say, because he's full of ideas. Uh, we used to have a research meeting at Hopkins every week in his lab. And he comes up with 10 ideas and he wants us to explore how you can do the experiment to come out 
with uh, whether it works or it do not work because all ideas do not materialize to the clinic. There are several ideas which must have been dropped before they come into the clinic. And his contributions are plenty, as you have seen here. Uh, the retinal implant is his brainchild. Since uh, Mark is a biomedical engineer, he has given the opportunity to Mark to pursue further so that it will be useful to the world. And uh, the small incisions and the drug delivery systems and a uh, lot of drugs which are very useful for the chorea capillaries and re uh, retinal pigment epithelial health are also in his pipeline. So in nutshell, he, th this man is a moving ideas with a lot of innovations and he's a best example of a clinician with innovations. If you have any questions for the next two minutes, uh, he will be pleased to answer to that. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, Jay. A very Jay nice talk, Dr. Ask. Wen. And I think we all have been... Uh, Can really you give him a microphone? Yeah. We all are really blessed to have people like you who have taken the technology and brought us uh, to the stage of providing a best clinical care. But how do you think that over these last 20, 25 years, even in the United States, how the situation has changed for the innovators? Can you just give some brief? Because in India, we are just starting the concept of innovations. How do you feel that the whole overall approach to innovators have changed uh, in the last 25 years? Well, first of all, I, I do think the culture, the, the society is much more um, accepting in medicine for innovation. Uh, when I started, uh, I remember when I started in ophthalmology, uh, the there was a, the academic sites didn't uh, support the idea of intraocular lenses or phacoemulsification. And you had the, the leaders at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Mamani, and others saying that this should not be done. Well, it was very early. It was not as good, obviously, as it is now. But they should have uh, been much more aggressive in, in developing it. Now, uh, most of the innovations are coming not just from the university. They're coming, they're kind of being um, imagined within universities and then being developed outside of the university. And that's what uh, I've been doing. And I do think places like um, India, China uh, have uh, the possibility of um, pushing forward these these ideas more quickly. And uh, in the next talk, I'm going to talk a little more about how I see what is happening in the future, not, you know, not uh, how long it takes for an idea to get out there, 30 years, like some of these. But, you know, what are we going to be able to do? And, and I do think that, you know, societies like in India, like in China, that must innovate to provide great care uh, professor, can I ask you something? Uh, these uh, innovations, when they are patented, then they are in the hands of some companies which make it difficult for common people to, ex uh, to access it. So can there be some way by which there should be something to make it accessible also and reduce the commercial part of it? Because we have found that uh, suddenly, you know, you have a patent and the thing become beyond the reach of a common man for which the innovation was made. So it defeats the purpose. Yeah, so, uh, I think it's a really important question. For a company, they have to make money. They, there's no other way that they, uh, I sometimes explain that even if you had a cure for cancer and if you couldn't pay the person to deliver it to the patient, Somebody has to get up in the morning and take it to <laughs> that person that needs that cure. And he, he won't be able to do it for free. So it has to be some sort of economic system that, that 
that pushes it. For, for as, as an individual getting started, and we all have ideas, that's the, the, we all have ideas. Every time I watch somebody give a presentation, I go, yeah, I thought about that 20 years ago, but I didn't do anything, you know? And so, so it's, we have to do it. You have to have a little bit of passion to want to do it. You have to believe that it's very valuable. And, and uh, I think the first thing is to get it out there. You don't care. But the companies, after you get one or two things out, then you, you might have enough energy to get a patent. Patent, all the patent does, it's not so important except it protects economic value. It's not, a, it's not valuable for anything except for economic value. And then, uh, so, then there's some, so it's learning and I think it's just a, a desire to do it like anything else. Yeah, are there any questions anymore? Otherwise, uh, Jay? Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Andrews. Um, he is the CEO of ENSCO, which is a very, very important body in Australia, New Zealand, which holds the eye care standards. And he has contributed quite a bit uh, to set the high standards in the eye care, especially the education. So with this, I would request Dr. Andrews to give his lecture. Thank you. So a little intermission between Dr. Duan, Duan's talks. Uh, very interesting, the first one. Um, thank you very much for your welcome. Uh, it's, it's been great to attend this meeting, my first trip to India. But um, I'm here with five other fellows from Australia, all of whom uh, have backgrounds in, in India itself. Um, and we've been very welcomed and experienced uh, a great time here. I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, the standards of eye care in Australia and New Zealand and how that's uh, evolving, changing, and um, the direction that we see it going in. So uh, in Australia and uh, New Zealand, uh, all, all the medical colleges are accredited by the Australian or New Zealand Medical Council. And it's a very rigorous process that's undertaken every three years. Um, requires annual reports. There's actually 15 medical colleges in Australia and New Zealand, we're one of those, um, and many of them have areas of subspecialty. And it's the only way that you can become an ophthalmologist uh, in Australia or New Zealand, other than if you're from overseas, and I'll get to that later. Um, so you have to do your training through us. The process of accreditation itself is funded by the college, um, and it requires quite a lot of external involvement from experts in the area. And we're assessed against currently 10 standards, um, and we've developed a five-year training program around those 10 standards. So we're not only responsible for all the trainees, um, the registrars in Australia and New Zealand, but also all ongoing professional development and accreditation of the uh, specialist international medical graduates, many of whom do come from uh, India and regions around here. We have an annual CPD program, um, which is about to be called a professional performance framework, and I'll explain a little bit more about that shortly. So the 10 standards that we're accredited against is the context of training and education, uh, which just means that the hospitals itself, the, where it happens. So we actually are then required to accredit the hospital posts uh, where the training happens. Um, what the outcome of the education and training is going to be, uh, what an ophthalmologist will look like at the end of that training program, how it's uh, developed in the framework, which is essentially the curriculum, um, and that's a really big area that we're concentrating on at the moment. The different teaching and learning methods are uh, used, and uh, there's quite a lot of evolution, as you can imagine, in that space, particularly with online learning opportunities, webinars, uh, simulators, and so on. And so we're, we're trying to incorporate all of those into what is essentially an apprenticeship model uh, of teaching medical specialists and has been for well over 100 years. Um, the assessment of learning. Uh, so of course there's many different ways you can do assessment, not simply by exams. There's clinical assessment, there's regular everyday interaction type assessments, um, there's assessments of many different skills other than just clinical. Then we have to monitor and evaluate 
the outcomes of all of this and use the feedback from that to continue to refine the processes. There's been a particular issue, uh, focus on issues relating to trainees. So over the last few years, um, I guess the best way of putting it is that trainees have a lot more say in what uh, happens in the training process itself and how that's um, how they're involved in the training process and if there are any issues with trainees they um, there's, there's a lot more that we're required to do we can't simply just kick people off the training program because we don't think they're very good anymore um, there's the implementation of the training program that's the different resources we use and then as I said we're responsible for CPD further training remediation so people may come to us and say, I need some remediation in a particular area. That's, of course, very rare. But the medical board can come and say, this person is not performing particularly well. We, we know there's a high complication rate. If they were going to continue to practice in this area, you, the college, are going to need to work with them on a remediation program and get them back into the system. Uh, so that happens from time to time. And then finally, we have the assessment of this uh, specialist international medical graduates. So essentially it's a five year training program to try and fit those uh, initial eight um, standards in, in. So we have a two year basic training program uh, where they have to start to develop clinical skills and knowledge in ophthalmic sciences and basic competencies and so on. There's a, a two year advanced program. So there's a large exam at the end of the first two years. There's a large exam at the end of the second two years, which uh, is, is essentially the final exam that they would have to do to become a qualified ophthalmologist. Um, and uh, in, in that second two years, they, they really have to develop the, the knowledge and the skills and so on to become uh, an independently functioning ophthalmologist. And um, throughout this whole training program, there are six areas of non-medical competencies which we're now assessing against communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, scholar and professional. They're very, very hard obviously to uh, test in a, an exam situation, you can't do that. So these are the skills that are tested every quarter, every three month rotation. The uh, trainees are, are assessed by the supervisors against these scores and if uh, against these competencies and if they receive a score below a particular number they have to go on remediation for that area. This is the hardest area to test and it's the one that causes us the most problems and it's generally the one that causes uh, the doctors the most problems in their interactions with patients. So it's a tricky area but it's something that we think is extremely important when they become uh, consultants. And in the final year they, they're allowed to develop whatever special experience, specialist experience they want um, in, in being able to function independently in the community. And from time to time, people come to India, Nepal, they go uh, to Fiji. Um, anyway, there's lots of different places that they go and, and receive their training. Uh, just a snapshot of the basic training. There's anatomy, physiology, optics, clinical, pharmacology, emergency medicine. And then there's those basic competencies where it's not really diagnosing, uh, diagnosis or management, but it's just developing the skills that they will need in the second stage, which is the advanced training. Throughout the process, many of them will be doing cataract surgery. Many of them will have done cataracts by the time they actually enter the training program. But they will really become uh, independent uh, at, a, at being able to do cataracts. Uh, they have to understand genetics and microbiology, refraction, etc. All of those things that are listed there. Um, so what, we've, what we're trying to develop is an independent, uh, comprehensive ophthalmologist. So anyone finishing the training program will be effectively the same standard in their clinical medical knowledge across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and this is where it becomes a little bit tricky with the SIMG process. So all overseas doctors have to apply through the medical board or the medical council in New Zealand and then they come to be assessed by RANSCO. And uh, they must be comparable with a recently trained RANSCO graduate, i.e they have to be a comprehensive ophthalmologist. They have to be able to uh, function effectively across all areas and not just in a subspecialty. And they must be able to do surgery. Uh, and this is what trips up many of the international graduates coming from overseas. They may have done work in a particular country where they do subspecialise very quickly. They may not have done much paediatrics, may not have done much uveitis, whatever it is. Uh, and they really just can't function in the Australian system. 
because when you're registered in Australia, you're registered to be able to uh, provide services in all areas. So we let you loose on the public and you might say, I'm only ever going to be doing paediatrics work. But if the paediatrics work dries up and you decide to do a few glaucoma stents or start working in glaucoma and you may not be so confident in that, that could become a problem for the public. It becomes a problem for us. Uh, so in many cases we require people to do either a little bit of additional training or have a, a period of observation or even sit the final RANSCO written and clinical exams. So one of the other things, area of standards that we've been developing lately is what we call the collaborative care pathways. And these are in the three major chronic diseases. Uh, and this came out because um, there's been a bit of a, a scope of practice uh, issue between optometry and ophthalmology to a lesser extent GPs, really optometry and ophthalmology, in how do we manage these chronic diseases, who gets to do what. So we decided, well, we need to work with the optometrists, they're an important part of the eye care team, but we really don't feel that they should be holding on to glaucoma patients forever, uh, in some cases um, just referring around within, amongst themselves without referring on to an ophthalmologist. So we thought we'll develop some clear guidelines um, around referral patterns and, and at what point should they refer. So there's, there's a, a flow chart essentially and if a patient gets to a particular point in the disease they should be referred to an ophthalmologist. Now the ophthalmologist might then refer them back to the optometrist or to the GP or whoever and uh, we, we've, we've worked with the um, optometrists to develop these guidelines and they seem to be well accepted. Um, certainly glaucoma and AMD, uh, people understand that now. There's still a bit of debate about diabetic retinopathy because it's such a tricky area and there's so many people involved in diabetes. But ultimately we think it'll be lower cost to the patient because they won't be um, being seen by optometrists too often or the optometrists won't refer everything on and when they're a little bit scared so they don't really know what they're supposed to be looking for. If we provide the guidelines we say if you see up to this you're okay, you can deal with it. You should have had the training to deal with it. Beyond that, you have to send it to an ophthalmologist. And it also then protects um, the optometrists because if they do hang on to them for too long and an issue arises, well, they can, we can look at the guidelines and say, well, you really should have been following the guidelines. So it, it was a bit, there was a resistance initially, but I think everyone's understanding that at the end of the day, it's in the best interest of the patients that this is how it's done. So Ransco's gone out and developed those standards. Um, so I mentioned earlier the professional performance framework and this is really a strengthening of our CPD uh, and it's in to ensure that their pay, the, the doctors remain safe in active practice. Um, in particular it'll be CPD with uh, a stronger assessment for those who are over the age of 70 uh, and that's been seen as a, an area where people start to lose their skills but may not recognise or may have the insight that they might be losing their skills so they have to undergo initially a peer review and a health check at when they reach 70 and then that might be every three or four years they haven't finally decided that. And also for people who might be professionally isolated which is uh, those in regional and rural areas. Um, there's obviously a, a stronger assessment of, of those who might have multiple complaints but really what they're doing is saying that we just not would do our normal CPD if you do clinical audits, if you're involved in peer review, uh, at regular peer review uh, through practice or through other means um, every couple of years, then you should be able to keep functioning effectively uh, as a, a high quality ophthalmologist or high quality doctor in the Australian New Zealand medical system. And again, it's about providing patient safety and giving reinsurance to the public that whoever they go and see will be uh, at the top of their game. So in conclusion, um, education is the core business of Ransco. It underpins many of our activities, uh, even for the, for the fellows, those who are beyond the training years. It's tightly regulated against the standards. As I said, we're required to have an assessment every three years of how we're providing uh, the resources to meet the standards. It absolutely drives our training program, our CPD and our assessment of overseas doctors. And around 50% of fellows are directly involved in training um, almost on a, a weekly basis, uh, if not a daily basis. So that's quite a large number who are, who are engaged with the college through that program, those programs. 
Uh, and finally, I just wanted to highlight some of the major events that Ransco will be holding in the next few years. Um, in uh, November, we've got our 50th uh, anniversary uh, meeting in Sydney, and we're holding that in conjunction with the American Academy of Pediatric um, Ophthalmology and the Asia Pacific uh, uh, equivalent. Um, in March 2020, we're hosting both the APAO and the IAPB conferences in Auckland back to back. So the APAO in 2020 will be in Auckland, it will finish on a half day and then the IOPB will start the same day and, and go on for another couple of days. So I'd encourage you all, uh, if you are involved in any of those, to certainly put that into your diary for 2020. And finally, in um, February 2022, um, in Melbourne, we'll be hosting the ICO uh, World Ophthalmology Congress and that will be a, a huge event and uh, I would certainly expect to see you all down there. Melbourne will be fantastic at that time of year. Um, and there'll be a packed uh, agenda for you all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Andrews. Are there any questions for him? You, you want to ask something? Uh, can you pass can on the microphone? Floor mic mic here? Yeah. Floor mic. Use the floor mic. Yeah, Dr. Andrews. You said accreditation is must every three years. There. Is there any ranking of accreditation is there? Is there any ranking? You say every three years there is accreditation there. So is there any ranking like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie? And if so, is there any importance of ranking? Any ranking on the accreditation, did you say? Yeah. Uh, not really. It's either you're in or you're out. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, a, it's quite a complex process. Um, of course, it would be very difficult for the Medical Council to uh, de-accredit a college because they really don't have a, a fallback option. But having said that, um, they do hold us to a very, very high standard. Um, and and if, we, if we don't meet the standards, then we have conditions that we have to meet. And, and in our last accreditation, we had a, quite a number of conditions that we're required to meet with milestones every year over the next three years before we are re-accredited again. So it forces us to lift our game each time. So I think the thing to, to understand is also that, that we're talking about we're at very high in the game anyway, so we're going from here to here. It's not like we're down there and trying to get up to here, and that would be the same for most of the medical colleges. It's, it's uh, you know, incremental improvements, I think. In India, we do have accreditation, and there is a ranking for that, but it is not must. It just ranks an individual whether Top institutes will be alpha ranking, then Bravo ranking, like. Yes. But it is not must by. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In India. Thank yeah. you. I have a small question for you, yeah. Dr. David. Uh, in UK, we have uh, the the surgical assessment of not only the candidates, but also the consultants over a period of time. Yep. Surgical assessment. Now, my only mm, uh, hesitation in uh, in saying this is correct is. Because if uh, your surgical skill is being assessed mm. by somebody else who is going to decide and judge, it adds a lot of stress yep. to the already stressful surgery. When you are doing ophthalmic microsurgery, yeah. if nobody, sometimes I don't know, allow anybody outsider in the theater because I know it adds to the stress. I may be very confident, but still I don't allow. Yeah. In the same way, live surgery induces a lot of stress. Mm. So some surgeons don't like to do live surgery. Yeah. Now tell me, how do you really in, uh, assess the surgical skills in your assessment scheme? Yes. Uh, well, certainly with the trainees, um, they're obviously observed and they would be used to doing that. Um, and that's the only way they're going to learn, is to have somebody with them. But once the, you've reached fellowship, it's, it's not the same as the UK model. Um, then we're not required to go and assess people uh, during the surgical process and they're not required to sit further exams as they are in the US. Um, so it's, it's more about uh, the clinical audit. Um, people will be required to, to work in their area of specialty and present on a regular basis, maybe once every one or two years, on complication rates, uh, the type of work that they're doing, and if, if, if their complication rate is higher than, say, the peer average, uh, then, then that might be considered a, a, a way of assessing how they're performing. 
and at that point they either voluntarily ask for some assistance or, or go and do a course somewhere that we might provide or if it's really bad, um, we can, the medical board can insist that somebody comes in and observes, which of course puts stress on them, but there's really no way around it otherwise. And it's very rare. It would be one, one every, I don't know, couple of five years, six years. Yeah. Yeah. David, I, I think you, what you might mention is that we've got registries. We've got uh, yes, that's uh, true. a pipe retinal blindness registry on outcomes of intravitreal injections. We have a cataract registry. We've got a keratoconus registry. We've got a corneal registry where you uh, put in your results. It's de-identified, so if you looked at the registry, you wouldn't know which were my cases, which were your cases. And the, these registries give you a snapshot of your own performance as well as the performance of your peers. So you know yourself where you stand. Mm. These registries are voluntary, so you can either join them or you can do your own audit uh, to see where what your visual outcomes are or what your injection rates are, what your you know, complication rates are, and that allows you to keep generally within the, the spectrum of uh, what would be considered a safe practice. Uh, for a medical graduate who has just, uh, as, a, as a fresher, and he wants to pursue uh, training in Australia or New Zealand, like I, we know in uh, UK we have to sit for the PLAB examination yep. for yeah. entry. Uh, what is the system there and how to go about it? Uh, well, there's, a, there's a, a language test, which would probably be fine for most people from here. Um, but uh, then it, they don't have to sit a, a test as such. They just have to get a short-term training position, which come up frequently in hospitals. Um, the, the position needs to be accredited by RANSCO, but not the person going into the position. The person going into the position just needs to provide sufficient evidence to the medical board that they've had the required training. And, but it is very much short term, six months, one year type training. And do you recommend uh, somebody to have a basic training in ophthalmology in India before going applying for uh, Australian training? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, if you wanted to get on the, to the training program without having any training in India, then you would have to go into the, just the general training uh, entrance itself and there's it's very, very difficult, so we have about four times the number of applicants to the number of training positions available. But once, you, if you've been trained in India, so it's sort of like almost like a fellowship position that you'd be coming to do in Australia, that's a little bit easier to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now uh, we'll uh, go again to Gene. Uh, he's not only innovator, his foresight is very good. If you see the retinal implants, the work idea started 25 years ago, and even now we are on to the human trials at the beginning of human trials. Almost a quarter of a century for retinal implants. So, but he could envisage that it is going to stay there, right? So uh, he chosen a topic for 10 years, though it is very short for any innovation to come for clinic, uh, his views about uh, the future 10 years in retina, uh, what innovations can help us, it will be very interesting to listen. Jean. Thank you again. And uh, this is, so this is um, a little bit of what I know and I'm working on, but there, it's at the stage that most other people don't know in this area. I mean, and just, and you'll see what I'm talking about as I get into this. So I always like, I tell my fellows, my students, my colleagues, that they say, what are you working on or what, how do you pick? And most people say, well, this is what I'm interested in. I say, I don't do, I don't work on things I'm interested in. I try to work on things that are important. I'm interested in everything. I'm interested in how old the earth is. I'm interested in many things, but I work on things, I try to work on things that are important. So I'm going to make some predictions, roughly 10 predictions over the next 10 years. 
And one will be, we're going to treat glaucoma with a needle stick that everybody can do. Every, that we can train anybody to do a needle stick under topical anesthesia that's safe and durable. I think the world needs this. No medicine will work for treatment of chronic glaucoma, no drops. You can't get it in most places. Patients, even when they don't have any problem with the payment, don't take it. Uh, so we need a simple, safe, f uh, topical anesthesia, fast intervention. It needs to be able to be done by surgeons or technicians. Uh, it shouldn't, the skill shouldn't be so high. There should be no late complications. In other words, if you do a normal trabeculectomy, there's an instance of blab infection or inophthalmitis, other things, and it needs to have long-term efficacy. That was the concept around uh, this uh, device that we developed called SIPAS. It's just a, it's basically it's a controlled cyclodialysis. You put the, you have a small needle. You can see these things look very much like vitreoretinal retinal instruments. Basically, they were modeled similarly and we place it in, in at the bottom of the scleral spur into the supracoral space. It migrates. It can be done actually with loops without a, a microscope. Obviously, ophthalmologists, particularly glaucoma specialists, love to see this very carefully with, with uh, gonio precision, but uh, it can be done. And I train many uh, in the lab just placing it uh, based on uh, just a, a looking through the cornea. I'm going to predict that in the next 10 years, 100% we're going to have full accommodating OLs. OLs that are not multifocal, that don't split light, or that extended depth of focus that blur over a, a place. We'll have a lens that actually uses the ciliary body to uh, change power and shape uh, just like our normal lens. There, I think it will be a shape change IOL, and, uh, and I think it, it, we will uh, have it. With 30 million of these procedures, many of them done here around the world, restoring normal, youthful uh, vision would be an amazing uh, achievement for us. Here's one such lens uh, that uh, we're working on uh, and that you can see uh, towards the bottom. Uh, if you know Logmar visual acuities, which I wasn't familiar with until I started working in this area, uh, this is corrected near vision of 0.17. That's a little bit, that's like 2030, a little better than 2030 um, uh, vision at near. This is unilateral, so with bilateral it should be 2025 uh, over that. And this is in a prototype uh, lens. Good flat defocus curves. Uh, very, very interesting, and in I fully predict we will have this. We're not going to be doing monthly or bi-monthly or every three month injections for uh, diabetic retinopathy or choroidal neovascularization. Uh, we're going to have, uh, this was, uh, this is again something that uh, we've worked on in the past that now Genentech is developing. I think it will be going into a phase three uh, this year, I hope. Uh, and so these small reservoir set in the pars plana, delivering whatever drug, including large proteins. There has been no way to deliver proteins uh, basically to the eye except with an injection. So this, uh, this is a refillable uh, reservoir. It can, be, it can last six months, maybe a year. And I think at the same time, you know, there are hints that with chronic 
deliver a chronic suppression of these blood vessels, you can, uh, you can suppress the disease enough that it essentially goes dormant. And uh, so I'm very excited about this kind of therapy. I think there are other ways of doing it that people are developing, and I think it's going to be, have a big effect. Here's the device sitting under the conjunctiva now two years after it was implanted, and uh, the patient feels absolutely nothing because it's not going through any uh, real nerve tissues, just going through the conjunctiva, the needle, and uh, uh, eluding the drug over a period of time. Now I'm going to get a little bit further. I don't think in 10 years that we're going to be using drops. Drops to me are a very bad way of delivering medication. Somebody said at one point that putting drops on the eye and expecting them to get in reliably is like putting oil on the hood of your car and hoping that it gets in. It's, it's a it's a really, depending on how skilled you are in glaucoma in particular, where you have an older patient, uh, it's almost humorous to watch uh, videos of people putting in their drops. They do it very poorly, uh, many do it very poorly, and or need somebody to help them do it. So I think drops in general are a bad way of, of, of doing it. Uh, and there are much better ways for that we take the responsibility of delivering the medicine away from the patient and, and put it in our hands, put this, this is a ring that sits in the cul-de-sac and can elute glaucoma meds for one year. They could come in and they wouldn't have to put a drop, many patients would not have to put additional drops on top of this for one year. Interesting, this was first tested in, uh, in, in Sydney. <laughs> I'm going to make another prediction. And this, I'm making these predictions by, based on things that I know. These are not wild thoughts. These are where the science and the efforts and the investments are going to, to do this. So it's a really exciting time for ophthalmology, just some of these things that we're talking about. We're going to be able to cure dry MD. We've had some really important missteps recently, some failed drug trials uh, treating uh, geographic atrophy. But our, our, gen our knowledge about the genes, the genetic basis of this disease, has exploded. And we now have a very clear idea about the genetics of this disease. And two genes basically explain the vast majority of the, of the risk. Basically, in, in uh, European descent, uh, it's complement related. In Indo-Asian uh, descent, it's, it's another, drug, another gene called ARMS2, HTRA1. One, one is obviously related to the complement pathway. Complement factor H regulates the complement pathway. It's, so if the abnormalities in this gene prevent, uh, since it's a regulatory portion of the complement, complement kills cells, it, it kills bacteria, it, it marks things to get rid of in the, in the body. Complement factor H is the, it's one, of the, one of the proteins that protects uh, signals that uh, cell. It, pr it protects the pigment epithelium from being attacked by complement. In this case, if it's abnormal, it is uh, being actively um, activated throughout. And here's a picture of a drusen. This is what they call MAC attack complex. That's what injures uh, the, the cells. And you, the orange, and you can see here in the chorea capillaris, is being injured chronically with this MAC attack complex. Even though it's being bathed by this regulatory protein called factor H, if, if the factor H was working, there wouldn't be MAC being uh, 
uh, generated. This, this eventually causes more and more drusen to uh, occur with, um, with geographic atrophy being uh, proposed. So if we can create this more normal regulatory protein that is absent in this disease, maybe we can cure AMD. Uh, what we're, what's being learned about myopia and the development of myopia, I think is going to dramatically change uh, the instance of myopia in the next generation. Obviously, there are uh, uh, environmental issues like playing outside for one hour a day uh, and uh, you know, maybe a little bit less uh, near work and, and well, has had a pretty dramatic effect on how the kids uh, develop myopia from this. The use of cycloplegics, uh, I think, are still problematic in terms of how they are used, but we're learning that we need very little, and uh, maybe there are better ways of delivering it over the years so that uh, the kids don't have such a, a problem. Where in places like in Singapore, where over half the kids have issues of progressive myopia. The prosthesis, I do think, will continue to improve. This has uh, been a very um, long effort, now nearly 30 years, uh, but there are new designs and new efforts, particularly the subretinal ones, that I think uh, will continue to have the possibility of better vision. Uh, this is something that I don't think I, I need to tell y'all, but in the United States, um, I think nearly all ophthalmic surgery is going to happen in much more uh, simple environments. I call it the office-associated ASC, ambulatory surgery centers. If we can, our, our, in, our interventions are getting such much more like injections than they are like true surgery. We're not putting sutures, making tiny, in, uh, tiny incisions, uh, a variety of uh, instruments that I've become aware of. There's a, one to make uh, capsulotomy called menosis. This is a, a loop that cuts the lens in half or in six pieces just by putting it around without any phaco energy. It's called my loop, and, and obviously things like the 25 gauge, even 27 gauge, vitreo retinal surgical instruments. Uh, LASIK, I think, is a, is a great um, procedure from the patient standpoint. Very little pain, very little discomfort, uh, very rapid re uh, return of vision. But if we didn't have to make that cut in the cornea, it would be dramatically better, in my opinion. And I think there are a variety of t techniques being developed to change the corneal shape, either with cross-linking and uh, other, other ways that I think will, that LASIK in 10 years will be a dying uh, procedure. Finally, uh, uh, I think uh, home monitoring will dramatically change the number of patient visits that we're seeing. Things like glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, um, um, AMD monitoring with home OCT and home uh, visual field monitoring, I think will dramatically change how, how we monitor our patients. So our interventions are gonna be very, very much more office-based, we're going to see the patient less often in, the, in our clinics, and we're going to be monitoring them electronically uh, from afar. Uh, clearly, our future will be different in 10 years. We all know that, but it will be quite bright. The gene and cell therapies are extremely interesting for the most devastating of the diseases. Our medications are getting much more targeted and much more science-based. A lot of cost, I do think, will shift to patients rather than uh, government payers. But ophthalmology is in a good place because 
we demand our vision as a quality of life issue. Uh, hospitals, I think, will change very much and give way to highly functional new clinical settings. Again, uh, to quote uh, one of my fellow Alabamians, uh, Helen Keller, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gene, for a wonderful uh, oration. And I request our president, Dr. Rajit Babu Maji, to give you the honors for being a presidential guest. And uh, thank you very much, Gene, for coming all the way. Mm, yes. Okay. Ajit, Dr. Santan wants a photograph with the. And uh, anyhow, being a guest lecturer, I think it's wonderful to see Dream of Salmalji with you. And uh, Jean, I think you are coming after 22 years to India. Welcome to India again. Thank you, Dr. Jean, for uh, coming from uh, USA to uh, India. He's coming after 22 years, but he's a great personality there. Uh, and uh, with this, we declare that the session is uh, over, and we will hand over the microphone to the next session. Thank you all for uh, uh, participating in this session. Can you get the this thing started?
like an awesome thing. They'll come, people will come. So the ophthalmic Premier League will open in start in about five minutes time everyone. Namrata, get your videos ready please. One eight. I don't know where he is. I'll bet ask him. <coughs> is any team fully ready here?
Captains, please come on stage also. Manipal, Gaurav, Mohan, Professor Lahane has not come. Ragni, madam, jaldi ajao.